Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. I am super duper excited because I was recently fortunate enough to visit the Smithsonian American Art Museum and sit down with the director, Stephanie Stebish, for a chat. And this interview isn't focused on any one specific thing. We talk about Stephanie's work and some of the museum's exhibit, but also just what museums offer the world and how they fit into history. Stephanie has a passion for her work and for sharing art with the public that's completely infectious. And what she really cares about is how people engage with the museum. So when she first sat down with Holly for the interview, she asked Holly a question right out of the gate to find out what Holly thought of her time at the museum this morning. Yeah, uh, which is a little embarrassing because I might have cried in front of some art. Um, (laughs) We're going to pick up this interview with my answer, and then we'll start off my interview with Stephanie, which quickly opens up into the history of the building that houses the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So it's been amazing. I um, uh, mentioned to you before we came in that I had my little tearful moment with the Edmonia Lewis sculpture because I'm a great admirer of her and her life story is very inspiring. Uh, So that in and of itself was my great thing. And because we're here before it opens and to like have private time with a piece of art like that is beyond special to me. What I want to hear about from you, though, is there are some things that you showed me that we walked around together doing and some things that I walked around on my own experiencing, which I will ask you about in a bit. But before we get to any of that, I want to ask you how you landed here. Like, how does one become the lead of a place like this? Well, I would tell you, Holly, I have the greatest job uh, possible Uh, It is a job where every day I'm working with really talented, creative people. And I'm not just talking about my phenomenal staff, but artists who come here, people who have a passion and collect, uh, people who want to write about what we present, art critics and thinkers, uh, and also people who have never been here before, as well as people who love this place deeply and and have their favorite uh, objects, favorite places in the museum. So how do you grow up and become a museum director? Well, I would tell you the Smithsonian is in many ways the Harvard of of art museums because we are this big family of museums. Uh, We're the largest research and museum complex in the world. Uh, We are these sort of official national museums of different subject matters. So in my case, it's American art, as well as I run the Renwick Gallery, which is the National Museum of Craft. Uh, And then you go through the National Museum of African Art and the Cooper Hewitt and on and on, all these specialties. I I grew up in museums. I I felt at home in museums. I studied art history and um, there are different pathways. I could have taught. I could have worked at an auction house or a gallery. I could have written. Uh, but when you work in a museum, you get to touch that many more lives. Uh, you get to constantly learn. It's a graduate seminar with every special exhibition we do. When we make really tough decisions about which works of art we're going to accept or with limited dollars purchase, uh, we are making an important statement about time and place. And I like to say in museums, we're in the forever business. Oh, that's beautiful. So there's a, there's a sacred duty, and I would tell you, uh, I often tell my staff that museums are a team sport. Yes, I have the good luck of being the director, but it's really a team. Nobody can do this work alone. It's just, it's just too many facets to, um, to have any single person. Even, even our curators who, who think up these wonderful projects, it, it depends on so many arms and legs to get something done here. I love it. And I mean, I, just in our short time walking around with some of your staff, that's abundantly clear uh, that just everyone here, one, is incredibly smart, incredibly engaged. Like I talking to even like just the people that are walking through doing maintenance stuff, yeah. nobody is like just clocking in and doing their job. Yeah. Like they all seem to really... Holly, museums are generally happy places. <laughs> Right? Which is great. People come with some leisure time. They come with their friends. They come with their family. They come on special occasions. They come to share things that are deeply meaningful to them. Uh, they come for fun. They come for surprise. Uh, hopefully they leave uh, remembering something that they saw. That, that, uh, that, that. I, I like to think that um, 
the gift artists give us uh, when we encounter their work and really spend time with the work is uh, that artists change the way we see the world. Yeah. One, one object, one artwork at a time. So the building we are in as well, you gave me a quick version earlier. You took us into the secret room, which is off of what appears to initially be a very standard sort of coat room. And then there's a secret room, which has some really cool uh, insights into the building's history. Will you talk about this building's history and how it how it's evolved over the years to where it is now? Sure. It's a spectacular building. It uh, spans two city blocks, 7th to 9th Street, and uh, is boundaried by F and G streets. And so we have entrances on both sides. And that secret room you'll find on the F Street entrance. As you perhaps hang up your coat or leave your bag, you'll see there's a, a little chamber in the back where we have left uncovered the um, the structure of the building because uh, this was built as the uh, patent office for the United States, the third federal building built after the White House and the Capitol. And you have to imagine, this must be a very important building. It's where American entrepreneurship and creativity is at home. And it's a pretty good choice to locate the National Museum of American Art. So the building originally housed shelves, rows and rows of shelves of patent models. President Andrew Jackson signed legislation about uh, around patent law, which mandated that uh, as an inventor, you had to bring forward a model of your of your invention plus drawings and explain how this was made, and that future inventors could come and look and say, oh, actually, uh, what I have is an improvement, is a variation on an existing patent. Again, you have to uh, be, your patent has to be reviewed even today. And recently I heard, Holly, you might find fascinating, the 10 millionth U.S. patent was issued recently. 10 million. It's astonishing to think about all of the ingenuity that the preceding uh, numbers all contained in many cases. Yes. Like so, it, it just says a great deal about the never-ending quest to make new things and fill gaps that we need. And it's sort of beautiful. Indeed. And, and this historic building uh, also went through some uh, transformations. It was built to be fireproof, so that meant originally, you know, stay away from wooden beams and, and work with iron tresses and such, and uh, built in the Greek Revival style. It, uh, during the Civil War, uh, housed a hospital. Uh, Walt Whitman would come here and uh, read to injured uh, soldiers uh, and uh, in its uh, incarnation as the patent office, the very important Claire Barton worked here. We would know her for two important reasons. Of course, she was the founder of the American Red Cross. And in today's important conversation about gender equality, she was the first uh, government um, employee who was given equal pay for equal work. Claire Barton here at the old patent office. And it also housed earlier iterations and collections of uh, the Smithsonian. And then thankfully in 1968, uh, after a significant um, restoration, was the official home for uh, the Smithsonian American Art Museum and our sister museum, the National Portrait Gallery. And it's so beautiful. Uh, walking around, I spied something very cool, which has been <laughs> retained despite updates and things being renovated. There is a tiny piece of graffiti that yes. you guys kept, and now it's almost its own little secret artwork exhibit. Will you talk about that a little bit? Yes. I uh, I think museums have wonderful objects uh, that we caretake, and hopefully we display it in intriguing and beautiful ways, provocative ways sometimes. And yet, let's not forget the house in which we sit, uh, whether it's a, um, a contemporary building, and there are wonderful star architects who are building great museums these days, but many museums are located in historic buildings, you know, repurposed. And so if we can bring a little bit of the magic out, if we can remind people that um, uh, that these great uh, facilities had important roles, not only we were a civil war hospital, but we were the home for Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural ball, because it was one of the largest spaces in Washington, D.C. for such an event. 
Yeah. I, do we have any insight into who the mystery CHF that, that I, I w- their initials? I is? wish I could <laughs> tell you. I wish I could tell you that it was Walt Whitman himself. No, um, not the case. Uh, however, Walt Whitman, uh, uh, there are echoes of Walt Whitman around the city. So I invite you to go to the DuPont Circle train uh, metro exit and etched in the entry and exit tunnel is the Walt Whitman poem about his days reading to um, Civil War, um, you know, injured. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. So for listeners, it's a tiny little piece of uh, like a, a window frame yes. that just has the initial CHF carved in it. And then it's dated August 8th, 1864. And you guys have put this beautiful, just a little glass over it. And it it is sort of funny because when you look at it straight on, it almost looks like you just mounted a picture on the wall. But then when you see it from the side, you realize it's just protecting something that's part of this building's history. I'm so glad you found it, Holly. We uh, want people to look closely at works of art and then also uh, explore a little bit of the building. So when you're in the Great Hall, which was where Lincoln's inauguration was, and if you look at the floor, it feels different than in the rest of the building. You're not on marble floors. You're not even on wood gallery floors. You're on beautiful tiled floors. And because that is a completely different style, there was a fire uh, in 1877 in this building. And so... Uh, a new architectural style was added to our Greek Revival building, something called Neo-Renaissance. And um, so a very different uh, grandeur was uh, was added to the building, gave it a bit of an update. I hope everyone who visits the Smithsonian American Art Museum seeks out that little bit of preserved graffiti that we talked about. It just feels so unique and special, and it tethers the building to its past. Coming up, Stephanie will share two stories about places in the building she thinks are extra special and that visitors should make sure to visit. But first, we will take a quick sponsor break. You uh, mentioned that this was, at one point, the U.S. Patent Office. And you still have on display some unique pieces that are, you know, old patents and their models. Uh, will you talk about some of those or some of your fa- one or two of your favorites, perhaps? Sure, Holly. I uh, I always invite visitors to explore this really large building, uh, the, the three different floors, and then uh, make a beeline for two very special places. One is called the Loose Foundation Center for American Art, uh, which is where we're uh, located right now. And there are uh, a, a couple of sort of mezzanine levels uh, of shelves and open storage, as we like to call it. There are 3,000 works of art on view across all media. And then tucked in another corner, that you and I spied uh, and walked over a little bit is the Lunder Conservation Center, the first visible conservation center in, in a museum. So the patent models we thought would be important to still show, and we have an understanding with the patent office that uh, a couple of delightful, I would say, both failed models and things we still enjoy today, like a butter churn, or I think you uh, spied a, a sewing machine. I did. Uh, so these wonderful models are tagged with a wonderful sort of calligraphy, uh, indicating their number, a little bit of their history. We have reproductions of some of the drawings that talk about process and Use, uh, and we also have a, a timeline of um, of the of the usage of the of the museum. So it's uh, in Bay Twenty One when you're up on the sort of mezzanine level of the loose um, center. Yeah, it's uh, there are so many wonderful little nooks and crannies all over this building. But so I'm glad that you uh, directed people where to go if they want to see that because <laughs> it might be tricky to find it uh, if you don't know the building terribly well. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about is an exhibit that you guys just opened, which is called Artists Respond, and it's American Art in the Vietnam War. One, that's a really impactful exhibit to walk through. It is not an easy exhibit to walk through. Um, A lot of those pieces are not what we would call like pretty art. Um, They are moving and visceral and very frightening in some ways and arresting. Uh, Will you talk about just that exhibit, why it is important, why you wanted to have it here at the Smithsonian, um, and also just, you know, your thoughts on it and how the whole thing came together? Mm. Uh, Thank you, Holly. I'm so glad you have... um 
uh, invited me to spend a moment on this exhibition. So this is a project that's been five years in the making. It really takes that long to identify works, to hone your your theories and your messages, to uh, write catalog entries and essays, um, to, and to ship everything here, and uh, and also raise the funds to to make it all happen. Uh, this is an exhibition that uh, is a window into a moment, uh, a moment of the American experience. The Vietnam War, by any definition, was one of the most contested uh, moments in American life. It touched our political life, our military experience, our social understanding, and artists were among those who were grappling with um, this war that for many people uh, arrived in your living room. It was sort of the first sort of televised war. And uh, so you would be sitting down to dinner with your family and uh, there would be the on your screen the notices of how many people were, were killed or injured. Uh, and that is reflected in a fabulous piece by Edward Keenholz that we have on display. Uh, this exhibition looks at a unique time period, 1965 to 75, the, the sort of key moments, the escalation of the war as well. And uh, it is fundamentally an anti-war exhibition. I think uh, uh, it is it is not designed to be... Um, anti-American. And I, I don't see uh, the artists making that statement. They may question the American government. They may question the the ideals that are not being upheld um, in this moment. There is uh, uh, a moment where this conflict would forever change American art. Why? Because if you're making pop art or abstract expressionist art in the preceding decades, that's not the language where you can talk about loss that you can talk about the body, yeah. that you can talk about ideals or American identity or atrocities or places far, you know, far, far away. It's really interesting because I feel like, um, one, growing up in a military family where my dad was in the Vietnam War and never wanted to talk about it, it's really enlightening. Again, I was tiny at that point, so it wasn't as though I have my own memories of it. But it is enlightening even for me, who I feel like, you know, I study history and I read up on these things and have personal connection. But even so, it really captures what was going on socially in a way that I think we don't often see. Um, you know, it's an education in and of itself about what what it felt like to be an American during the late 60s and early 70s that I think is incredibly important. Um, I wonder what the reception has been in the short time it's been open. It's only been open like a week and a half, right? Uh, yes, yes. I think people have understood that this is a, an important topic. It's really the first and sort of largest you know, most comprehensive view of this moment in time. It is both feels very contemporary and the artists were making work in response uh, to that moment. And again, the exhibition has works only from that a decade, much as, of course, we we offer some interpretation spaces and, and, and talk about, you know, the Maya Lin's Vietnam War Memorial, because we are, of course, here in Washington, D.C., and it is something that in many ways brought the country back together again, you know, after the shattering experience of the war. The exhibition also feels very historic uh, in terms of uh, moments that speak to the Democratic uh, Convention, also a tough moment in Chicago. It's an exhibition that invites a lot more voices into the story than we were used to, both at the time um, and even sometimes today. So many more works by women artists, by um, people of color are included. I think people will be surprised how many works by veterans are in the exhibition, uh, and they, too, grapple with their dual identity as an artist and as a veteran. It's also a show that confronts you with different media, so there'll be an environment, there'll be graphic posters, there'll be some photojournalist images, there'll be big, bold paintings, there are photographs of performances uh, included, and I would tell you, a lot of these artists weren't necessarily making the art for the art world. They weren't necessarily expecting the works to be displayed, and a lot of dealers really didn't want to show this work. And it was work that in many ways was not always fully formed, was still uh, in process. So you'll find people you know, like Judy Chicago and Chris Burton, and you'll find people you may 
no less, like Jesse Trevino uh, um, and, and Kim Jones, both vets, or somebody as impactful as Rupert Garcia. So uh, an incredible mix. Yeah, the the breadth of artwork in that exhibit. I as I was walking through, I kept going, "Wait, is there's more down here? Like it's huge." It is a big show, and uh, believe it or not, we had to, we 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 did a pretty good job of editing. Not not everything you want to borrow is available, and yet people also are very generous in their loans. And you have to kind of track down who owns something because it may change hands uh, during that time. I would also say that uh, art critics have picked up that this is an exhibition that is worth writing about and hopefully encouraging people to visit. So we had early previews in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and a complimentary review in the Washington Post calling it a must-see exhibition. And I hope it is an exhibition you see with other people and that you can both respond to the works of art and also to your memories or your understanding of that of that moment. Uh, again, conveyed through art. This I have to keep reminding people, Holly, it's fundamentally an art exhibition. Much as we are pausing and trying to remember what exactly happened in that year of 1969 and what changed again in 1971. I mean, we, we offer uh, timelines and, and other moments of context for our visitors, but it's really the art that we want you to uh, encounter. Yeah, and you guys have a unique little setup uh, where people can kind of process where they're at in terms of like what they've experienced and how they're thinking about it. Will you talk a little bit about that? Because it's fascinating. Yes. I uh, More and more, we ask ourselves, how do our visitors get ready to see an exhibition? And how do we give them a space for, for pause? So uh, I have asked the curators to uh, plan for each exhibition to have a, a video, uh, a, a brief uh, moment where you can stand. You don't necessarily need to sit. We're not making black box spaces, but some kind of moment where we can talk about the artist or the time period or what was going on historically, just preparing visitors and letting every visitor come in sort of at a, at a, at a same, uh, same level of information that, that we're offering. And then in, in you go through the exhibition and, and the rooms are thematically laid out. Uh, they're numbered. So we do think that there is a, a, a story to be told as, as you move from room one to, to five or so. And then at the end, comfortable seating, a pencil, catalogs, books, a timeline, images, uh, revisiting the artworks uh, in a chronological sense instead of in a thematic sense, updating the story a little bit, uh, reminding you what has happened since, and then asking you which works of art spoke to you. Which works of art will you not forget? Uh, which works were familiar to you or artists that you you know in one context, but did not ever think that they would be making art that would speak um, to the Vietnam War experience. Yeah, it's a an amazing thing. I kind of wish every museum exhibit had it. <laughs> uh, more and more, I think we... Um, we want to know more uh, uh, about how our visitors come into the museum. What is their frame of reference? What is their frame of knowledge? Uh, and how do we give them a uh, quiet space for, uh, for interpretation, for, um, for sorting through before you, again, jump into another gallery, a different time moment, a different material? We want people to to rest their eyes too. Yeah, um, uh, I want to shift gears a little bit because I you mentioned earlier to me before we started your favorite piece here, and I would love for you to talk about that a little bit. Oh, Holly, I I, I have a favorite piece of the day uh, at the at the museum here. We have forty four thousand works of art, and I'm constantly learning something new. I have the pleasure of meeting artists and then seeing the work maybe through their eyes, or when we purchase something. Um, that becomes a new favorite. So remind me, what did I tell you was my favorite? Something that Helen Keller owned. Ah, but it is not my object. I'm happy to tell you about a work in the Smithsonian's collection. Gotcha. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the American Art Museum, we hold 44,000 works of art in trust. But sure. this story is so lovely. Indeed. I don't want to miss so out on it. So the Smithsonian Institution, um, which is supported by your tax dollars as well as private contributions— holds 155 million objects. 
imagine that. Now, let's uh, let's imagine that most of those are maybe bugs in the Natural History Museum, but among <laughs> those incredible um, objects that tell us about ourselves, our time, about um, uh, 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 um, uh, about what we're thinking and, and feeling, is uh, an object that I'm very uh, interested in, which is Helen Keller's watch. Okay, so pause for a second and imagine what you would think it would look like. It's not a wristwatch. It's a pocket watch, okay? Was it made for her? No, actually, it was a gift. Who would have a watch that would be useful to Helen Keller? If I told you it was a diplomat, if I told you it was a pocket watch, if I told you it was a watch that you could feel the time on so that there was an you know, internal mechanism that where time would be represented on the outside so that a diplomat would be diplomatic <laughs> in <laughs> ending a meeting or um, being on time someplace. And this was a gift to Helen Keller that she treasured. And... Um, uh, makes us think uh, differently about timekeeping and how uh, somebody who overcame so much uh, would find use in something that other people would uh, could also own and, and would have routinely. I love that. Uh, it's just such a fascinating little, I don't know, is it a piece of trivia to yeah. know that? It's just wonderful. Yeah. Let me, can I tell you why I'm interested in this? Object yes, college? of course. So I, I wear another hat or two or three at the Smithsonian, aside from running the American Art Museum and the Renwick Gallery. There are pan-institutional or Smithsonian-wide initiatives. And one of them is the American Women's History Initiative. I'm the co-chair of this. And we are uh, spending the next five years to pull the threads together of all the stories of American women through science, through history, through natural history, through art, through politics, every which way that um, remarkable women and also everyday women have contributed to the American experience to American history. So there are two uh, cornerstone anchoring exhibitions. One opens, coincidentally, on March 28th here in the old Patent Office building. My sister museum, the National Portrait Gallery, is doing a Votes for Women exhibition, obviously geared towards the um, anniversary of suffrage, which did not give all women the right to vote. You have to remember uh, in in the South during the Jim Crow period, uh, Black women were not um, enfranchised. They would um, also have the bookend to that opening exhibition in the coming years is an exhibition called Girlhood, It's Complicated, which talks about growing into your own identity as a woman. So the phases of um, myth-making and reality of uh, American girlhood. And so the Helen Keller story is is part of that exhibition, which will travel nationally. Go oh, to, that's wonderful. Go to maybe half a dozen museums. Wow, that'll be fantastic. Coming up, Stephanie is going to talk a little bit about how even the frames that art is displayed in are an important part of an object's story. But first, we're going to pause and have a word from one of the sponsors that keeps this show going. know that you are obviously keenly interested in history. Uh, there was also another little bit of trivia that you told me as we were walking around talking about conservation and picture frames. Ah. Will you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, one of the uh, special places here at the museum is the Lunder Conservation Center that I may have mentioned earlier. And when you uh, are up in that space, what you encounter are floor-to-ceiling window panes. It is basically a glass box, and we have five conservation labs that are visible to um, to anyone who, who comes up there. So our conservators are working diligently away in a framing studio, in an objects laboratory, in the time-based media space, in the painting um, lab. And we uh, try to reveal a little bit about the magic of um, uh, of of how we present works of art, how artists create things. And so in the framing studio, you'll see different styles of frames um, that will explain, you know, how they're crafted. Uh, close to the window, you'll see 
a little sampler of uh, papers. So there's a gold leaf, there's silver leaf, there's copper leaf, things like that. And um, more and more, we want to try to encourage our visitors to understand that there's something very special to a historic frame that perhaps the artist was very intentional about the frame that they wanted. Maybe they even created the frame. Or maybe it was important for a collector to have um, frames that uh, really showcased um, and, and uh, showcased the artwork. And, and gilding was often for the distinctive purpose of making the artwork glow. Uh, with limited um, domestic lighting, it would reflect the lighting and, and the painting better. So uh, in the future, we will be adjusting our labels and pointing out to our visitors when it's an original frame. I love that so much. Won't, won't, won't that, I think, maybe start or maybe even stop a conversation? Wait, did you see that? It's an original <laughs> frame. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think about um, there are a couple of art pieces I have bought fairly recently in New Orleans where the frames were made out of refuse from the hurricane. And to me, like, that's exactly kind of the same thing. It's just historically oriented. And in a hundred years, someone will have that tag on and they'll be like, oh, it will add weight and depth to their understanding of, of that piece of art as they're taking it in. So Yes, and, and framing, Holly, is ever-evolving. Uh, museums will take frames off um, and say, you know what, that frame it speaks more to the collector and their desire to have one type of frame uh, versus what was really uh, more typical for this kind of, uh, of an object. Uh, museums go to great lengths to restore, in some cases recreate frames to, again, honor, uh, honor the work of art. I love it. Uh, you, obviously, because of your position, I don't, I don't want to get too heady or make you feel weird, but obviously you are the steward of a place that is maintaining and, you know, bolstering history and how it's told. So I wonder, is it too weird for you to think about in a hundred years when someone looks back on your directorship, what would you like them to remember? Ah, well, I appreciate that you uh, understand that uh, these jobs are temporary, that we're all stewards, that uh, it's... Um, uh, I'm, I'm doing my very best to make sure that I advocate for visitors, that, that uh, what we have to share uh, is meaningful to the people who come through our doors. And I'm happy to report that museum visitation is at, uh, at an all-time high. Uh, last year, we welcomed some 2 million visitors, and this past year, 3 million visitors. It is a huge uptick. Now, of course, it's a special exhibition. It's, uh, it's things that capture people's imagination that they want to see, and uh, and we're delighted when when that happens. Uh, and of course, we keep asking ourselves, who are we not speaking to? Um, who uh, who needs different works of art to feel welcome at the museum and be represented here? Uh, and I think mostly my impact will be uh, which works of art. I had the good luck of uh, bringing into the collection and encouraging our curators to be bold and inviting people to be generous to help us purchase things. Uh, hopefully my legacy will be uh, some special exhibitions that will be groundbreaking, like our Artists Respond, uh, American Art in the Vietnam War, 1965 to 1975 project, or our Burning Man exhibition at the Renwick Gallery uh, to ensure the exhibitions are bigger and bolder. Uh, I, I want to make sure that I'm educating the next generation of uh, scholars in, in, our, in our fellowship program, which is going to be 50 years old next year, oldest, largest, uh, and premier program in American art and, and visual culture, that we caretake these objects in the Lunder Conservation Center, and that mostly, Holly, people feel at home that this is their museum, that the Smithsonian American Art Museum is deeply meaningful for people throughout their lives. I feel like your legacy is going to be that you opened the doors wider. Well, that's certainly uh, my charge because we are free. That is an amazing thing to offer all of this for free. We are open every single day of the year. I didn't know except that. Except Christmas. I did not know that. And so, uh, and in this building, the old patent office, we have later hours. We're open till seven o'clock at night. The only Smithsonian with such late hours. And it gives us a different vibe and a different energy. Uh, and I'm happy to report we're also among the favorite of the Smithsonian Museums in the sense that after the National Zoo, we have the highest repeat visitation. 53% of our visitors come again. 
Wow. And we're not on the National Mall. So yeah, no. yeah we're, we're a destination. <laughs> I love it. We're a destination. Uh, it speaks to the amazing work that you've been doing. I cannot thank you enough for having us today. Like this has been dreamy. Well, Holly, I, uh, I tell you, this is a place for the people of curious minds. This is a place for fun as well. Uh, we want you to get, uh, get your hands dirty as well, too, when we've got great family day programs. Let me tell you about one of my favorite yeah. programs, if you, don't, if you don't mind. We do something that I've never seen at any other museum because, believe it or not, we collect video games. We see video games as art in terms of the composition, in terms of the narrative, in terms of the of the elements that uh, that go into it, and they often have a story component to them. So uh, every year for some ten years or so now, we've been doing something called the Sam Arcade. You know what an arcade is? Oh yeah, the museum, the fabulous Kogod Courtyard, and other spaces in the museum are filled with all kinds of games and video games. They are free. We invite people to be polite and only use them for some 15 minutes or so, and people are very good about that. And let me tell you, there are motorcycles parked outside the museum. There are uh, vans parked outside of, of the museum. There are people you know, pouring out of the metro station, young and old, English as their first language, as their second or third language. Uh, we feature new kinds of games, games that use historic elements and have uh, a sense of chance that relate to uh, to biblical stories, uh, um, a, a piece uh, about Walden Pond where you travel uh, through the house and look at historic uh, objects, how you go into the woods and have to chop down a tree to make the log cabin. Uh, amazing kind of fantasy games that you you play by yourself or with others. And um, best of all, you wander through the rest of the museum as you're as you're <laughs> going on. It's a two day event. We have over ten thousand people come, and uh, it invites us to think about doing the next art of video games exhibition, both at the museum and and to center around the country. I will be here for that again. The American experience. You'll get tired Amer of seeing me. An American creativity. <laughs> For sure. I love it. Again, thank you so much. What a delight for me. My pleasure. Come back. I feel so spoiled. <laughs> I like to say tell everyone, and I mean that not in the tell everyone to come, but tell everyone that you want to come with them here. Yeah. Again, back to the social experience of museums. I feel like it is kind of impossible to not want to run to the Smithsonian American Art Museum after hearing Stephanie Stevish talk about it. If you'd like to run to the museum and you want to check out the exhibit that we mentioned in the show, Artists Respond, American Art and the Vietnam War, 1965 to 1975, that exhibit is open now and it will run until August 18th. We are also going to be sure to include a link to their website with information about that exhibit in our show notes. Super big thanks once again to Stephanie for being on the show. Uh, I have a quick little bit of listener mail if you'd like. Cool. I'm on a roll where I really am enjoying our mails from, uh, from educators. So this is from our listener, Jessica, who writes, Hi, Holly and Tracy. I am a full-time special ed teacher and a part-time history buff. I started listening to your podcast a few months ago, and I'm constantly amazed by the amount of content Stuff You Missed in History Class has covered. My goal is to be able to give you guys an idea for a show someday, but every time I come up with one, I find that you've covered it already. So then I quickly find it in the archives and listen voraciously. Recently, I was reading the book Brave Harriet by Marissa Moss with my students. This introduced them to Harriet Quimby, who was the first woman to fly across the English Channel. Not surprisingly, after a quick search of the archives, I found that Harriet was mentioned in a previous podcast back in 2012. So I quickly downloaded the show and shared it with my students, and they were so excited to learn more about this American aviator. Thank you so much for all that you do to keep stories like these relevant and interest younger generations of history lovers. Um... Thank you so much, Jessica. Again, I have to say um, thank you for being an educator because we need those and it is a, a, a noble endeavor, I certainly feel. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com or you can come and visit us anywhere on social media where we are missed in history. We're also at mistinhistory.com uh, as our website and all of the shows that have ever existed can be found right there. If you would like to subscribe to the show, you can do that on the iHeartRadio app at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. <music> 
Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 